Okay, let's get started. Welcome, I'm Marie Harvey and I'm the Associate Dean for Research in the College of Public Health and Human Sciences. And I'm delighted that you're joining us today. Um, today's seminar is co-sponsored by the Nutrition Academic Program. And to that end, Russ Turner, who is a professor of nutrition and he's all, also the interim head of the School of Biological and Population Health Sciences here in the college has agreed to actually introduce our speaker and to moderate the session. He'll also provide a bit of information about how to uh, ask your questions at the, end of the at the end of the presentation. So let's not delay any longer and let's get started. And so please join me in welcoming um, Dr. Russ Turner. Hello, uh, I'm Russell Turner. And so I'll be functioning as the moderator. And so uh, today's uh, uh, seminar is gonna be presented by Dr. David Dallas, who's an assistant professor in the nutrition program. And the topic is a very important one, understanding human and bovine milk digestion. And so he will, he will present the material, uh, 35, 40 minute long presentation. As you go along, you're welcome to write uh, uh, or did you, uh, formulate your questions and present them in the question and answer section. It will be on the bottom of your screen. And then following the presentation, I will read, uh, I will read the questions and, uh, and they will answer them. So without any further time being spent on this, let's, uh, let's have Dave start. Okay, hi everybody. Um, let me share my PowerPoint with you. Okay, um, can we see it? Okay, great. Um, so thanks Russ and Marie for the introduction and for inviting me to give my talk today. So I have titled my talk, Understanding Human and Bovine Milk Digestion. Um, that is the focus of my research. Um, and so that's what I'll focus on today, but maybe also give some insights into some things that are kind of spin-offs from that work as well. So my work is driven by the question, what makes a diet healthy? And um, there's a lot of nutrition is, is a very complicated field. And there's a lot of uh, controversy about what's good for you and what's bad for you. Um, and because it's so complicated, um, I have selected to look at milk as a model for human nourishment, as a model that um, is, is less complicated as a starting place. So I choose milk because it is the product of over 200 million years at least of mammalian evolution. And um, you can see here different, you know, milk uh, varies based on the animal that produces it. And there's this relentless um, selective pressure on milk. Um, it is very energetically expensive to produce for the mom. Um, and so there is a balance. So everything that's in milk is produced from the mom. She has to dissolve her own tissues to make it. And um, so everything must be beneficial for the infant. Uh, if not, it's a waste of maternal energy stores. Um, and so we know that even though milk is highly complex, there are thousands of different molecules, proteins, carbohydrates, fats in it we know that they have beneficial functions. So it's a great place to look for bioactive compounds. Um, and this differs from um, plants, you know, which make up a lot of our diet. Um, plants uh, have not evolved for, you know, to provide optimal nourishment for humans. Um, in fact, plants um, produce a lot of they have a lot of ways to avoid predation because they can't run away from a predator. So like a cactus puts on 
spines to avoid being eaten. And a lot of plants produce um, toxins um, that can help protect them from predation. Um, so, you know, the majority of plants that are out there, we as humans can't consume them. Um, so when I, so although we know that, you know, a diet high in, in fruits and vegetables is very beneficial, um, there are a lot of compounds that we don't know about yet and we don't understand um, what their functions are. And so this is a, a more complex model to look at. So I focus on, on milk as this um, still very complex molecularly, but less complex from a perspective of whether something is going to be beneficial or not. So I, my goal is to use milk as a, a blueprint to unlock um, secrets of what is optimal nutrition. Uh, so I have focused on proteins for the most part. Uh, so this is the structure of lactoferrin. So milk is, there are thousands of different proteins in milk. Um, and many of them have different functions. Um, they might be produced in different parts of the body, but also in milk. Um, a lot of these proteins, we don't know what the function is in the infant or whether they are important. Um, we do know that milk provides a, a wonderful balanced source of essential amino acids for the infant, um, but are milk proteins providing more than just um, the amino acids to build protein structures? Are they providing additional functions? That's the question. And, you know, in, um, in lab studies, you know, looking at how proteins interact with different cells, um, there are a lot of potential actions of milk proteins, um, like antimicrobial actions or immunomodulatory actions. But my question um, has always been, well, so there may be these bioactive proteins in milk, but what actually happens inside the gut? Do these proteins survive uh, amidst a, a milieu of very intensive proteolytic degradation that occurs? Um, so proteases in the stomach and acid in the stomach and the complex um, of pancreatic proteases and um, other proteases in the intestine, these all are working to break down proteins. So which proteins can survive to be able to exert function? And as part of that, um, I became interested in um, partially digested proteins. So uh, it turns out that many proteins have been shown in, from milk, have been shown when they are partially broken down to release these pieces of themselves that are called peptides uh, that have functions that may be the same as the parent protein, or they may be different. Um, it depends. There's lots of different functions like antimicrobial, um, blood pressure lowering, um, calcium binding to help, um, help with absorption of calcium in the infant in modulating the immune system, opioid activity, um, as well as um, stimulating the growth of beneficial bacteria. So we know that milk proteins, when they're degraded, can produce these bioactive components, but the same question is still present for, as for proteins, do these peptides actually get created in the gut? Um, we only know so far that they get Though that we only knew that those were created um, in vitro, um, where you digest something in a in a test tube. So what actually happens in the gut? And so uh, I've worked for a number of years on um, getting samples to to assess these questions. So I started with um, using nasogastric tubes that were already in place in preterm infants and 
um, term infants that are in the neonatal intensive care unit. And some of these infants already had these in place because that was how they're being fed because they're like normal naso, um, their, their normal like suckling reflexes weren't working properly or for other conditions. And since then we've expanded um, to the very challenging collection of intestinal samples from these infants. So we run a second tube um, and place it into the, um, the upper jejunum. So the, just past the duodenum. And we're able to collect samples to see what's happened at different time points of digestion in the stomach and the intestine to try to identify what of milk's protein component really matters. Um, what, yeah, what of it has the potential to have real bioactive importance in the gut. Uh, so the point of this slide is just to say that, um, you know, once we get samples, our lab does a variety of different extraction procedures to extract the compounds that we're interested in, um, whether they're peptides or glycopeptides or proteins. Um, we do a lot of lab work and extraction methodology, um, and then eventually um, analyze samples via mass spectrometry as our, our main analytical tool set. Um, and mass spectrometry um, you know, is a very fancy machine that basically is weighing the, the mass of molecules. And by determining their mass, um, is a, we're able to identify what the structure that we're, um, is basically. So it's a, a way to identify um, these molecules that are very, very small. And so um, another tool set that we've, we've kind of created over this time is um, a bioactive peptide database. So we went through all the literature that's available on bioactive peptides and created a large database um, that contains hundreds of bioactive peptides from um, human, bovine, goat, other mammals, milks. Um, and we created like a free search tool so people can input their peptidomics data, uh, their data of peptides that they identify in different samples and search for functional peptides, search for things that are similar to previously identified antimicrobial or immunomodulatory or other functional peptides. So far, we've found some really interesting things. Um, we've found and kind of shown in many different ways now that um, milk is not just producing proteins um, and secreting them intact for the infant, but actually there's a lot of proteases that the mom produces as well that begin to break down proteins even inside the mammary gland. So when milk is ex excreted, it's a mixture of intact proteins and partially degraded proteins. Um, and many of these um, segments of proteins have bioactivity. Um, they are antimicrobial, immunomodulatory, opioid activity, um, those sorts of things. Um, so just this concept that milk is helping the infant uh, break down proteins that the milk is producing. Sorry. And then this, um, you know, looking at the stomach, this is just a diagram that I made a while ago, looking at like, how does protease digestion work in the stomach? But the overall point is that um, in the stomach, we were able to observe additional protein digestion that happens there, the release of um, many more bioactive peptides that could be functional later on in the gut, um, as well as the survival of some milk proteins. Um, and that there are proteases produced by the mom uh, in the milk that additionally help with this digestive process. And we've done some comparisons of preterm babies with term babies. 
And um, the, the reason that we've done that is because there's a suspicion that preterm infants may not be able to digest as well as term infants because they're born early and there's a delayed maturation of the gastrointestinal tract. Um, and what we found confirmed some of this idea. Uh, we found lower levels of the infant's own proteases acting uh, within the stomach. And we found that there were a lot of differences in terms of what peptide, what protein fragments are produced, um, as well as differences in the survival of specific proteins like immunoglobulins. And that might be important because um, it means that term infants and preterm infants are exposed to different biological um, bioactive components of milk. Um, and that, you know, merits further research to find out, you know, why that might matter. Oh, sorry. Again, I've got this crazy slides. But uh, the, the next point is that we have also examined the intestinal samples. And we found that, you know, after the introduction of the proteases in the intestine, um, there is a shift in what sort of proteins are still present and what peptides are released. And we found um, an array of bioactive peptides that are present in the small intestine and thus have potential to interact with um, intestinal cells. Um, so like uh, mucin producing cells and enterocytes and macrophages. So that's kind of led to work that I'll talk about in the future slides, um, examining the effect of these bioactive peptides on those kinds of intestinal cells. And then uh, we've also looked at the stool of infants. Um, we found that there is um, survival of certain sections, certain segments of, of these proteins that persist all the way to the stool. And that means that they could interact with um, bacteria, uh, through the colon or colonocytes, which we'll um, want to evaluate in the future. So some um, studies that we've done on the bioactive peptides uh, that have been recovered from the intestinal samples, um, we've been able to show that um, some of the peptides that we have found um, and then synthesized. We've tested them with different kinds of bacteria and we found that they can inhibit the growth of certain kinds of pathogenic bacteria like Staphylococcus aureus and E. coli um, while not inhibiting uh, very much the growth of beneficial bacteria like Bifidobacteria infantis. Um, and I don't have it on this slide, but there's additional peptides that we've found that um, increase the growth of these beneficial bacteria, Bifidobacteria infantis. So these slides are, are all just different ways of showing that there's a reduction in the growth of these um, pathogenic bacteria with specific peptides that we were able to identify in the intestine. And then just some sampling of data um, looking at the effects on immune cells. So we've incubated um, both in vitro digested human milk um, and in vivo digested human milk with uh, macrophage cells um, and been able to show um, that they can cause changes in the production of cytokines. So like the inflammatory cytokine interleukin-8 um, and um, TNF-alpha and again I, um, IL-8 here. So there's a um, uh, concentration dependent uh, effect of milk peptides um, on these immune cells that we um, hope to explore more in the future. And um, while doing all of those things, we are also very interested in looking at the post translational modifications of proteins. So um, a very large number, the majority of 
proteins in human milk have chains of sugars attached to them. And these chains of sugars are called glycans and they're known to have um, a lot to play uh, important biological roles uh, in terms of how um, proteins interact with bacteria and cells and recognition proteins. So we're examining also the survival of the glycosylated um, proteins and peptides. And a postdoc in my group has worked a lot on this, Bumjin Kim, um, and has uh, developed a new, new methods in this area that um, have greatly increased the number of um, the, our ability to di detect these glycopeptides. Uh, it's actually a very, very challenging area. Um, so from another perspective, rather than looking at the bioactive peptides, uh, we are starting to look at the survival of bioactive proteins. So what proteins survive uh, without any degradation? And the first one that we've been looking at are the different kinds of antibodies that are present in mom's milk. Um, so like IgG, IgA, and IgM, there are different types. Um, they have functions inside the infant's gut, like binding to viruses and neutralizing them to prevent them from um, causing infections and preventing bacteria from binding to the enterocytes. And so um, we've done different approaches to look at these. So, um, you know, different ELISA tests as well as uh, quantitative mass spectrometry tests. Um, and our, our look at milk, mother's milk antibodies. Um, this is work that um, Jirapur and Lin Sekul Tai in my lab has been working on, um, have shown that milk antibodies themselves are particularly stable across the infant's stomach and intestine, um, and that some of them survive to the stool. And we've looked at that from just generic antibodies as well as antibodies specific to specific um, bacteria and viruses. Um, and we also completed a project where we looked at um, the survival of non-native antibodies. So rather than looking at um, human milk antibodies, we've looked at recombinant antibodies um, because we were part of a group that was trying to recreate some of the benefits of human milk by creating cocktails of antibodies that could be given to infants to help increase their um, defense against pathogens. Um, but what we found actually was the recombinant antibodies that we were testing um, were digested um, to a much greater extent than the naturally occurring antibodies in human milk. Um, so they, based on ELISA and based on um, plaque neutralization assays, so whether they're able to block the virus, we're able to show that those get degraded quite quickly. Um, so, you know, our takeaway from that is something about milk antibodies structurally um, is, makes them uh, particularly stable, um, more so than standard uh, recombinant antibodies. And therefore we need to look more into milk antibody structure to model um, our you know, bioengineering um, to produce more stable antibodies that can be used in the gut. Uh, and a, an, another project that we've been working on is focus on donor milk. So donor milk, uh, preterm infants are often given donor milk because mothers of preterm infants often have difficulty um, producing enough milk. So most, most infants in the NICU um, have to receive at least some donor milk. Um, they are recommended to consume donor milk rather than formula because donor milk has shown to reduce the risk of some gut diseases like necrotizing enterocolitis that can be really dangerous for infants. Um, but uh, donor milk 
uh, because you're collecting milk from other moms and feeding it to different babies, um, we have to ensure that it's safe. And so the way that that's processed is by holder pasteurization, which is a heat treatment. Um, you put them in a, a heat bath and let them sit for 30 minutes. Um, that's great for destroying bacteria or killing bacteria, but it's problematic because it denatures, um, makes non-functional a lot of milk's key bioactive proteins. Um, in particular, um, there is a key enzyme that is produced in, um, in milk that is essential for the digestion of fat in infants. It's called bile salt stimulated lipase. Um, so it, it doesn't do anything inside the mammary gland, but then once it interacts with bile salts that are produced in the infant's intestine, it becomes active. And it actually adds about 30% uh, capacity to infant's ability to digest fat. Um, so this is likely the reason why um, a lot of observations have shown that donor milk um, has much less ability to enhance uh, linear growth of preterm infants. Um, so poor growth outcomes with donor milk um, and partially likely due to the degradation of the, um, the bile salt stimulated lipase, which um, is completely destroyed by this holder pasteurization approach. So we've been interested in how can we make milk, donor milk safe, but do a better job preserving its bioactivities. And so um, we looked at um, high pressure processing, um, UV light treatment, uh, as well as gamma irradiation uh, to compare them to the normal process, which is called LTLT or holder pasteurization. And we showed that um, all of these treatments were able to improve the retention of this um, key enzyme, this lipase, um, but that um, high pressure processing um, preserved it the most. And this was just uh, an initial um, test of looking at uh, a baseline pressure and time setting system. Um, and we, we think that we can um, reduce the pressure that's used and the time to further improve the retention of this um, bioactive component. Um, I'll come back to that. But um, some other work that we're doing in our lab is focus on bovine milk. You know, so my whole work is based around the concept that, you know, milk is beneficial. Um, but then people are always asking me, so what about, what about bovine milk? Is it actually beneficial for people who are not baby cows to be consuming? Um, so we were, you know, we're doing a lot of research, looking at different components of bovine milk to see what kinds of benefits they could have. Um, one of the projects that we're doing right now is looking at a large peptide called glycomacropeptide. Um, and it's a peptide that comes from a protein that's part of the casein micelles of milk. And actually, um, the reason that we're focused on this is because the cheese industry, um, when they use the enzyme rennet, to um, create curds in milk to, um, to coalesce caseins that, so they can use for cheese making, it releases this peptide. Um, and this peptide uh, is both very long and um, is often covered in these sugars, these glycans, um, is associated with the ability to feed beneficial bacteria, kill pathogenic bacteria, um, and prevent or um, help modulate the immune response of gut cells. So we're looking into that. Um, so Wyatt Olson is a grad student in my lab looking at um, the inflammatory response. So he's growing different um, macrophages uh, or different cell types, including macrophages with glycomacropeptide 
Um, and his initial work is confirming, you know, what has been observed previously in literature that incubation of these um, macrophage cells with glycomacropeptide knocks down the inflammatory um, cytokine response that we um, are inducing with, uh, oh, sorry, I didn't show those, uh, by inducing them with some inflammatory compounds. So we're showing the anti-inflammatory actions of glycomacropeptide. But the key question that we're trying to address is again, just like with, hum with infants, um, with adults, uh, are we able to, do these peptides survive? How much do we digest them? How much are they biologically relevant? And so um, we're collaborating with Samaritan Hospital in town and um, we're doing the same thing that we are doing with infants. Um, this is me. Um, we're sticking uh, naso jejunal tubes um, in, in, so putting tubes down the nose and then um, migrating them through the stomach and into the um, upper small intestine. And then we're collecting samples. So we are, you know, we have subjects come to the hospital in the morning, consume a shake containing the protein of interest. Um, so glycomacropeptide or whey proteins, we're, we're doing two different studies. Um, and then we wait for the food to pass by the end of the tube in the jejunum. And then we sample that. Uh, and then, you know, we do mass spectrometry on these samples. This is just an example showing like what that looks like. You know, we, I, we isolate a compound in the mass spectrometer and then we fragment it um, in order to identify what its composition is. And this is showing for um, a component of glycomacropeptide that was identified in the intestinal samples from humans. So, um, so far our results have been really interesting um, because people have just assumed that glycomacropeptide um, survives in the gut. And there have been animal studies that have shown benefits of GMP um, in terms of um, affecting the immune response and microbiome. Um, so we, people assume that it stays intact as its functional form um, but we're able to show in the um, intestine across time um, that, so in the feeding material, this purple bar represents the intact GMP. And then um, as we go over to orange and, and red, these are just small pieces of it. So amino acids, instead of the 64 amino acid glycomacropeptide, going down to six to 20 amino acid long chains. So these are what's actually showing up in the intestine. And there's basically no um, intact glycomacropeptide from either our studies feeding whey protein or feeding purified glycomacropeptide. Um, but what is interesting is that there are key regions of the glycomacropeptide that do appear to be surviving across time. Um, these seem to be chunks of the peptide that are more resistant. And so our next step will be to follow up on those chunks of peptide and see if they exert the initial, you know, similar bioactivities to the intact molecule and whether they could be what's responsible for the observed effects of glycomacropeptide in feeding studies. Um, sorry, slide, slide issues. Um, so we are, also completing uh, a longer term feeding study with um, whey proteins. And then um, we'll be starting this year with another one um, that will be feeding isolated glycomacropeptide. Um, so our first study, which is being completed by um, Brina Rackerby and Wyatt Olson in the lab. Um, we've, I think they're on week, um, week six right now of the study. Um, they've recruited 16 subjects, all um, 50 to 70 years old, and they consume a whey protein shake. Um, that's 35 grams of whey protein once daily. 
And then they're followed um, across time. There's a, a baseline week and three weeks of treatment where they consume this and then a three week washout period. And then we're collecting stool, blood, urine, and daily um, nutrition um, uh, like consumption logs. Um, and then testing how does this affect the fecal microbiome, the metabolome in the urine and blood, and the proteome, uh, the set of proteins that exist in the, the blood. So we're trying to look at how does consumption of whey protein and glycomacropeptide affect overall gut health outcomes? So what's next for our lab? Um, I'm really excited because um, we just got funding for a new clinical trial. Um, so we will be, now that we've shown that high pressure processed milk um, has benefits in terms of bile salt lipase over holder, we'll be testing that in preterm infants. Um, so we will be um, working with a high pressure processing facility in Portland and um, the donor milk bank there and producing um, this high pressure process donor milk. And then we're working with um, Oregon Health Sciences University in their NICU. And we will be actually feeding um, these differently processed milks for three weeks to preterm infants. And then we'll be tracking the amount of fat digestion that occurs in the infants, um, both by looking at lipase activity in their um, stomach and intestine, but also looking at the survival of fat to their stool. So look at the total amount that's absorbed. Um, and then we'll be looking at measures like um, linear growth, weight gain, um, head circumference to see if we can actually improve the growth of these infants. And then we have a lot of potential industry collaborations that we're working on setting up right now, um, looking at different aspects of digestion of bovine milk proteins and their bioactivities. Um, and then sort of future applications. So, you know, where do we go from here? Um, you know, we're looking for ways to improve feeding for preterm infants and term infants in general, um, perhaps using the knowledge that we generate to identify supplements of proteins that could be beneficial for adults for improving their health outcomes. Um, and just generally trying to figure out um, how we can optimize diets. And we have um, a, um, a new project that we're working on that's not milk, but is kind of taking the concept of milk where we have um, a highly digestible, highly bioavailable food. Um, and applying it to other um, sustainable protein sources. So we're, we were just funded by a small starting grant to look at um, microalgae. I know that's like way off from milk, but seeing if we can increase its digestibility and it's um, the bioavailability of its amino acids to make it a very high quality protein source. So we're just trying to think about ways that we can apply our knowledge of protein and protein digestion to improve health. Um, and so, yeah, so overall, milk's amazing. It's evolved for our nourishment, um, but we need to figure out um, what it's actually doing inside the infant and what bovine milk and other kinds of milk are doing inside the adult and how we can apply that to improve um, nourishment. So thanks to all of you for listening. I um, appreciate giving the chance to talk. And here is my um, COVID times lab group picture. Since we're not actually able to get together, this is all of us on Zoom. So thanks so much and happy to take questions. Okay, well, thank you, Dave. Uh, I do have some questions in the question and uh, answer. Um, uh, uh, area of my screen. And, uh, and then I also have a few questions uh, that I have, but, it, but I think this is a good opportunity now that you've heard the, the presentation uh, to think about what, what 
what you really want to have answered in the future or what they can answer now. So the, the first question, which the individual wrote the question, but basically decided that they may have already come to their own answer, but I think it's a good question. So I'm going to ask it. Uh, is the beneficial effect of milk, human milk, on healthy microbiome evident throughout life? Um, yes. So it uh, looks like you, you've kind of answered your question a little bit. Research is ongoing is, is kind of the answer I was going to give as well. So, um, I mean, we, microbiome is very fascinating. Um, you know, I think people are still trying to understand um, what kinds of shifts in the microbiome are beneficial um, and what that means. Um, there are some examples, um, you know, particularly with infants, where having a certain kind of bacteria is very beneficial for health outcomes, um, but we know less for adults. I mean, there are certain kinds of bacteria, like bifidobacteria, that are associated with benefits. So if you can feed something to shift the microbiome um, towards more of those um, beneficial bacteria, that could be, that could have benefits. And so kind of with our study right now, we're trying to look at both, is there a shift in the microbiome from feeding milk proteins? And if so, does it have any impact on health outcomes? So we're combining the microbiome with looking at um, the whole host of blood proteins, um, particularly inflammatory proteins to see if there's any changes that are, that occur together. Um, so yeah, so, but it, it's complicated. <laughs> the microbiome is particularly complicated. And I guess one of the questions would be, is that if we establish a microbiome based on, let's say an individual having, being breastfed, would that persist or, or could that change in a wide variety of ways as they, as they basically age? Yeah, yeah. So, I mean, there, there's a, a lot of changes that occur. So infants, if they have the right bacteria, um, amount of bifidobacteria, and they're um, consuming human milk regularly, they tend to have a, a pretty monolithic um, bacterial population that's associated with beneficial health. But um, as soon as we start consuming varied diets, um, diets that have lots of different kinds of plant fibers in them, then the microbiome changes rapidly to a more adult type microbiome. Um, Cause basically you're feeding bacteria um, a whole host of different glycans and they're all competing with each other to get access to those and use them as fuel. Um, but yeah, so there's a, there's changes that occur um, with time and you know, with the kinds of foods, the kinds of fibers that you consume shifts the microbiome as well. So we have two questions here that I think are a bit related. Uh, the first is, can you briefly discuss humans allergic to milk proteins, not lactose intolerance? Is this specific to bo bovine milk? It is known, is it known which peptide or protein could be the main allergen? Okay. Um, yeah, so um, there are specific human, um, there are specific milk protein allergies that can occur. Um, it is one of the most common protein, food protein allergies. Um, people can be allergic to a lot of different casein proteins as well as some of the whey proteins. Um, so that's, this does happen. Um, Infants can even be, there are some instances where they can develop allergies to their own mother's milk as well, uh, although that's rare. Um, and no, um, you know, I think the reason that we more commonly see bovine milk allergies as opposed to allergies from other animals' milks is simply that we consume more bovine milk. So the more exposure that you have to it, the more possibility you have of creating an immune response in the gut. Um, and in general, um, you know, there are some proteins and some chunks of proteins uh, in, in milk that are more likely to cause allergies, um, in part because they might be more resistant to digestion. Um, so yeah. 
Well, here, here's the related question. Have you examined goat milk? Uh, it is a popular belief that goat milk is not as uh, allergenic as cow milk. Is it true or is this fake news? Um, so yeah, my, my instinct on this is that um, it's a bit of fake news um, in that it really just depends on how much exposure you have and what your you know, risk factors are for developing allergy. Um, I, I think that there's a, there's a lot unknown about allergy um, development to food proteins, but there are some suggestions that um, it's more likely to be triggered if um, you are in a state of where your gut is not fully healthy. Um, so there might be more interaction between uh, dietary proteins and um, gut immune cells. But I would just say it's unlikely that there's anything special about goat milk that would make it less likely to be um, allergenic. It's just less exposure probably. Okay. So uh, um, since the gut microbiome matures as the child eats different foods, and changes from the way it was when the child had a milk only diet, then wouldn't it be best for adults to avoid milks altogether because our microbiome are not suited to milk anymore? Uh, yeah, great question. So um, I guess it's, so the microbiome shifts away from how it was when you know, milk was the predominant food source. Um, but that doesn't necessarily mean that reintroducing um, the kinds of components of milk and shifting things back towards perhaps how it, how it was before would be damaging. Um, I think that milk is, is uh, clever. I mean, uh, in that it has evolved to enhance the growth of certain kinds of bacteria that are, you know, non-damaging or beneficial. Um, whereas our current, you know, our adult diets, we're basically just consuming whatever we can, right? Like whatever there is available to nourish us. And so there's no, there's no evolutionary force there that is, you know, allowing us to drive what bacteria live in our gut, right? It's just, you know, we happen to eat corn and broccoli and those plants happen to have these fibers. And so these kinds of bacteria that, that are able to break down those bonds are, are there. It doesn't mean that the bacteria that are there are necessarily beneficial. Um, so another related question is, uh, is it common for adults to become allergic to milk proteins? It is um, possible but it's less common than um, for infants. So milk allergy is, milk protein allergy is most common in the first few years of life and then uh, decreases over time. So less common for adults. Yeah, I'll make a sort of editorial comment here is that if we look at uh, allergens, food allergens, Probably, uh, I think nine of the top 10 or maybe eight of the top 10 are plant material based. So it's certainly not unique to protein or, or, or uh, animal material. So that's, that's sort of important to recognize. Here's, a, here's one of my questions. And that is, you really uh, are focusing on, on uh, the, the basically digestion and the uh, basically what's going on in the stomach, the intestine, uh, going going through the body, but is there any evidence that any of these bioactive peptides actually is able to become introduced into the body? In other words, are do any of these end up in the blood? Uh, most likely, certainly on enterocytes and those cells, but do, are any of these incorporated uh, into into the rest of the body through the bloodstream? Yeah, so there's not much evidence to tell you the truth, Russ. Um, there's a few papers out there. There's a few that show some specific ant, um, peptides were found in the blood, but the techniques are not very good. Um, I mean, they're not 
they're not great evidence. Mm -hmm. um, but there are some stronger evidence for some specific proteins um, like lactoferrin and um, IgA have been found in the blood from mother's milk. But um, it's really not clear. It's very hard actually to do the analytics of blood uh, for peptidomics because there's so much other protein and peptides in the blood. So it's quite difficult to pick out the, um, the milk peptides from it. So we've tried to analyze them for quite some time, but haven't been able to um, identify milk peptides in the bloodstream. Mm -hmm. um, and the same is true for, you know, we looked at certain milk antibodies and we were not able to find them in the bloodstream either. So a, uh, a related question would be then is, uh, I could see why that would be really difficult, but can you see, let's say, circulating markers in terms of uh, immune factors that are present in the blood that are altered by, by uh, uh, the consumption of milk? Uh, can, can you look at this? This doesn't mean that the, that the, the actual uh, protein or peptide entered into the bloodstream, but that it, that cells being influenced by through the gut microbiome and immune cells are on, cell, on surfaces. Can can this be shown to occur? Um, we haven't, but I think that that would be the right route to take to look at that. So um, hopefully we'll be able to detect some signals like that in our human feeding studies. Um, that's that's what we'll be looking for to see if when you feed those proteins does it change the inflammatory response yeah and the uh, uh another sort of interesting question is that if milk is the perfect food for an infant how long can you live and be healthy on milk alone oh wow that's a really good question um hmm I mean, that's, that's, I mean, I'm afraid to like be controversial in my response, but I would say like, there's no reason that an adult couldn't live off of milk almost alone. Like it pretty much has all the vitamins and minerals um, that you need. Um, it's low in vitamin C and it's low in iron, I believe but maybe with a little bit of supplementation, uh, you would do fine. And I, I think that the crazy thing about milk is that we treat it as though it's nothing special, the way we process it. Like, you know, milk as a food source today, we heat treat it and we think of it just as amino acids and sugars and vitamins and minerals, but it could be way more than that. If we could figure out ways to process it that would retain the bioactive proteins. And then maybe we could find even optimizing, you know, we could find ways to, to even improve health um, with consumption of milk. So. And that leads into the obvious question is in terms of how milk, so when I go out and I consume my ice cream, uh, am, am, am I losing all the benefits besides calcium of milk? Am I, am I losing all those valuable bioactive uh, uh, peptides or am I actually still gaining at least some of them? Yeah, I know. And, and we don't know. We don't know yet because no one has taken the time to look <laughs> to, to find out yet. So we have no idea. I'm nutritionally speaking, people just assume it's just amino acids basically. So, um, but maybe, maybe you are getting benefits of bioactivities from your ice cream. So, uh, well, I kind of, uh, let's see, do we, I don't see any more questions. So, um, well, uh, if there are no more questions that show up here, I think what we should do is, uh, is uh, give Dave a round of applause. I think this has been very informative. Thank you, Russ. And thanks everyone for showing up today and giving us an hour of your precious Friday. So thanks so much.